Welcome back to the Fight Factory podcast right here on Premier Wrestling. And ladies and gentlemen, it is time to have one of our biggest, if not the biggest guest that we've had on this podcast. And the reason why I say biggest, I, yeah, look, last week I, I had the privilege to watch Chris Van Vliet talk to nobody across from him. <laughs> Kidding. John <laughs> Cena was on Chris Van Vliet's show. It was amazing. I saw the whole thing. Chris Van Vliet, bro, thank you so much for taking the time, man. Dave, so good to see you, and I said it off camera, but I want to say now that we're recording, congratulations on everything. Look at you. You're in your own studio. You're just rocking it with Premier. Congrats, man. Thank you so much. I'm trying, man. Trying to live the dream, and you know, it's it's one of those things where every time I see somebody that I aspire to be with her, I met you at the showcase at Premier last September, and I'm a, I'm a big Pat McAfee guy, and I look at these, I look at you, and I look at Pat, and I'm just like, man, they're having a lot of fun. They're having a lot of fun, but I know it wasn't always fun. Right. I know the the grind and the come up. And that's kind of where I wanted to start with all this because a lot of people see you interviewing John Cena and they're like, or, or anybody rather, like any of your past episodes that are um on your podcast, Insight, and I'm like, Well, how the hell does this guy get this guy? You know, like how, how does it, how does all that work? So explain to the masses if, if for whatever reason any of our listeners don't know who you are, how did you get started and where did you realize this is what I want to do? Well, look, first of all, the only thing that I have in common with Pat McAfee is the fact that we're having fun doing this. Like he is on a completely <laughs> other level with what he's doing. And I'm not wearing a hat right now, but my hat would be off if I was wearing <laughs> one because, man, he's just doing such a great job. Again, thank you for having me on the show. Of and course. My story goes all the way back to like being four years old. Mm. And I, I was just obsessed with the idea of broadcasting, like both radio and TV. And I had a Fisher Price tape recorder and I would with tapes, like actual tapes. And I would pretend to be the radio DJs that I heard on the radio. <laughs> That's where it goes back to. And I think what I love so much about broadcasting and also pro wrestling as well, because that's a through line here, is storytelling. Mm. At the heart of broadcasting, at the heart of podcasting, at the heart of pro wrestling is storytelling. And I'm so fortunate that I get to be the conduit through which these stories are told. Like I'm just genuinely a curious person. And I was always that kid asking why? But but why? Now you sound like my two year old. <laughs> no, well, then you've got a, a bunch of whys. broadcast right in your head. I know. <laughs> but that's where it, that's where it came from for me is like this. I, I was just curious, and mm. I still am to this day very curious. And what I love to do on my show is take someone who is at the absolute peak of their career, or they've accomplished an you know a ton. They they're living their dream, and reverse engineer that back to, yeah. But what were you doing when you were? in high school or what were you right. doing when you got cut from that team or what were you doing right. when you got let go or whatever it happens to be i want to be able to reverse engineer that back so that somebody listening can go oh wow when that person said that thing i saw myself in that situation and if that person who's accomplished so much can go on to have the career that they've had with that bump in the road what's possible for me too yeah, for sure. It's so funny you say the tape recorder thing. I, I used to be somewhat embarrassed, but I would I would turn the volume off of my Madden game and I would call the Madden game. And then I would get like I if that. I if I heard that like my mom or my dad were coming to her, I'm like, oh, you know, just shut up real quick. You know, like just like <laughs> pretend I wasn't doing it. But like yeah, yeah. Dude, and I kid you not, I'm 38, right? The I'll I'll catch myself still doing that from time to time. Like, just like, to the 25, 30, 35, 40. And I'm just like, why am that's I, great. Oh, what am I doing here? But like, that's what it is. You, you feel like you get this at a young age and you feel like the voice is something that Moro Ronaldo said that he realized that he had the tool at a very young age and just kind of ran with it. And I feel like you and I are both very much alike in that regard uh, of taking a passion and storytelling and just being curious about every single little nuance. And that's a big part of my career now is that I love seeing the behind the scenes stuff. You know, I love to see how it all develops. I love to see how many pieces of content can CVV pull out of this one. And sure enough, you pull a lot out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every single episode, I, I, you got me through a drive to Florida. I, I had drove to Florida wow. with Disney World and I said, look, if I'm going to listen to anything, I might as well listen to CVV on the way. I listen to Jericho and I listen to all all your interviews of that. I was like, this is this is money. I can listen to these guys talk all day because it becomes very conversational. It doesn't feel like somebody's drilling you with like these. Where are you on the night of it? You know what I mean? Like it feels like you're just hanging out with the boys or the girls. You know what I mean? So for that, and those were always the, those were always the interviews that I loved yeah. growing up. And like I grew up in Toronto, and one of the broadcasters that I loved watching. His name is George Strombolopoulos. And the thing that 
he was so good at was just making it sound like a conversation, whether mm. it was five minutes or 35 minutes. It just sounded like two people hanging out. That's why I love podcasting so much too, because there's really no other time in the world that we live in right now where you actually have to sit and listen to the other person because right. unfortunately we live in a time right now that you know two people go out for a beer or go out for dinner phones are on the table mm -hmm. maybe they're face down but you're mm -hmm. still still hearing them buzz or you're picking them up every 10 minutes just to see what's going on in the world in podcasting it's just like you're in the moment and there's very few times in our life now where we're in the moment and we're actually being present and the cool thing about podcasting is if you're just listening to it, you're now able to eavesdrop in on a conversation. Like, right. you know, if Joe Rogan and Elon Musk were sitting next to me at the restaurant, I'd be leaning my ear over and just kind of, <laughs> you know, having to you know, listen to what they had to say. And that's the cool thing about podcasting. So when, when exactly did you like, obviously on the come up, I've been in broadcast media since 2006. So I'm over, what is it? 18 years now? 16? I don't even know what year it is at this point. It's just I'll all blur it now. Um, but at what point did you feel like, all right, this is the path I got to take because a lot of people, you know, obviously I played sports, middle school, high school. I was an athlete. I wanted to be, you know, I, I got into pro wrestling at an older age, right? I trained in ring for a little while. I saw your backyard wrestling film, by the way. Stellar, <laughs> stellar performance. Um, oh, I listen. that's a shortcut of how to get injured. Like, uh, here. You want to break your neck? Just do what these kids are doing. <laughs> listen, I started in the backyard too, and and that was a big thing. My dad was always like, listen, you're, you're not getting a trampoline, so forget about it, right? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> all right. But, um, you know, at what point did you realize, you know what, if I just put my nose and ears to the ground and just, you know, cut out the garbage that's happening in today's world or whatever the case may be. Let's forget about politics. Let's forget about all the drama. I want to zero in on what I want to do. At what point did you, what was the aha moment for you? So uh, like you, I grew up playing sports. Baseball was my big sport. Of course, growing up in Canada, you play a lot of hockey, mm. but I was playing everything. Like I was also uh, doing track and field and cross country. I, I play, I loved sports. And I remember getting into high school and I just kind of heard through the grapevine. One of my friends or someone just said to me, are you taking communication studies this year? And I'm like, what's that? Like, what's communication studies? I said, oh, it's that TV class. And I'm like, what? There's a <laughs> class where we can like make TV? Like, I don't know how this wasn't like, you know, on, on the front door when you walked into the school. Like, that was crazy. I didn't know we had this. And we, I was just so fortunate that I went to a high school that had a mini little TV studio in there. And we learned the ins and outs of how to make TV. So you rotated around the studio. One day you were a VTR operator. One day you were doing audio. One day you were an assistant director. Then you were floor director, camera operator. And then two of those rotation spots were anchor A and anchor B. And I couldn't wait to get up there and like, and have that opportunity. And I'd done like plays in, in, uh, you know, public school before that, elementary school before that. And I always enjoyed the idea of performing, but I, I just didn't see what the path was to being able to, to do that. And communication studies opened my eyes to like, oh, we can tell stories through the medium of television. So it was that idea there. And then a few years later, I ran for vice president of my student council, not because I really wanted to be the vice president, but because the vice president got to do the morning announcements. Ah. So I turned the morning announcements basically into like my own radio show. Me and my friend. That's Mark great, like, man. Good morning, morning everybody. Now. CVV back in the building. And you're like, what? And the, the students are like, I mean, maybe I should listen to this one instead of listening to that boring, like, you know, whoever this is. This it, guy's got it, a booming voice. It's nine o'clock in the morning and we're like, good morning, Pine Ridge. <laughs> Nobody wanted to hear any of that. <laughs> It was just the idea of like, if you gave me a mic, hmm. I was going to do whatever I could to get some sort of reaction out of that audience. I was also hosting a talent show and hosting the fashion show in high school. So like, I loved that idea of getting a crowd reaction. So when it came time to apply for college, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know, but like communication studies was a really fun class. Let's take that. But the moment, the aha moment that I had, the epiphany I had was in my senior year of college. So I'm studying communication studies. It's great. I'm living with four of my best friends. I'm having the time of my life in college. And then I woke up in September of my senior year. So, you know, you've got whatever it is, seven months left of school, and then you graduate. And it hit me in that moment, Dave, that when we graduated, we had to go to work for, you know, the rest of our lives. Right. And it's so hard to put that into context when you're 21 years old and you're just having such a great time at school. 
But I was like, I, I, at the very least, I don't want to hate my job. So the goal wasn't, I want to have a job that I love and I'm excited to go to every day. I just don't want to hate my job for the next 50 years. I don't want to be one of those people who can't appreciate Sunday because they know they've got to wake up Monday morning and go to a job those they don't enjoy. Sunday more. scaries, right? Yeah. Exactly. So that was it for me. And I, it, the very next day, I reached out to every radio station and every TV station in my college town. And I just said, look, I'm a communication studies major, passionate about broadcasting. Can I just come in, volunteer, see how it's done in the real world? A lot of people didn't respond to me, but one radio station said, sure, come be on our street team, hand out stickers at events. This other TV station, which is like a community run station, they're like, yeah, we love volunteers. Anytime you can give us, come on in. Mm. And I was like operating cameras and I was the floor director for that show. And then this one radio station, 570 News in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada, said, we don't really take on volunteers, but how would you like a job? Ooh. And I said, yes, sure. So they hired me as a board operator. Nice. And that's when I started my, my career, like getting paid to be a board operator behind the scenes. And then when my shift was over, I would go into the recording booth and take the news scripts they had from the news um, report that day. And I would read them myself. And that's where it all began for me. It was it, it all stemmed from the idea of we've only got this one life. Mm -hmm. We've only got this one opportunity. I just don't want to hate this ride that I'm on going to work every single day, Monday to Friday, nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's so crazy you say that because like like you, I went to a community college because for whatever reason, maybe I wasn't the smartest guy or maybe I just wasn't the best test taker, okay? So when the SATs came around, I was like, F all this. <laughs> I'm not good at it. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so I went to a uh, community college journalism degree. I wanted to be a sports writer, cover my beloved Dallas Cowboys. A lot of people are going to now tune out because I'm a Cowboys fan. But anyway, um, but then I went to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. You're going to find this a great story because the reason why it's a funny story is because one of my teachers, his name was Mr. David LaGreca, was wow. a broadcasting teacher of mine. The best part about this is when the radio final came around. So he did the same thing with you. I would go station to station. Like, I'm like, editing, I don't want to edit. Like, I just want to, I want to talk, you know, I want to, I want to talk on the radio. So when that time came, I had a partner and I said, hey, listen, why don't we do our, our show on wrestling? You know, we both love pro wrestling. Why don't we do wrestling? So I said to Mr. LaGreca at the time, I said, hey, Dave, uh, me and my buddy over here, we're going to do a wrestling show. He's like, nah, who's going to listen to a wrestling show five days a week? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, now looking back, I'm like, you son of a bitch. You know, like, like now he's top one of the top dogs uh, with Busted Open. But even better story, I had a uh, a supervisor while I was working. I got hired at Sirius XM right after that as a, um, a board op. So I was doing the same thing, doing a lot of logging of film, blah, blah, blah. There was a supervisor younger than me. His name was Max Caster. Wow. And, and I'm like, well, he, had, he saw a couple of the photos that I've like scrolled by. He's like, man, I've always wanted to get into wrestling. How do I do that? I gave him the number and the contact information for Creator Pro New York. All of a sudden, he's now scissoring <laughs> with, with <laughs> Anthony Bowens and Billy Gunn and all that stuff. So it's a crazy tie-in story. But that was how I wanted to segue into the next thing. So obviously, you're you're doing your thing. You're You're taking on your first job. It took me a little bit longer to realize I did a lot of, you know, working at the pharmacy or working as a truck driver or working. I did a lot of that stuff, um, and which I don't, again, don't knock those professions. Those guys are hardworking, hard-nosed people, but I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. So how did you tie it in? You got your first job at, at a radio station. Where did pro wrestling get involved with this? I mean, obviously, you're now you're from Toronto, so I'm assuming that you know, I, I know you're probably a little younger than me. I don't even know how old you are at this point. I'm 40. I'm a little older. You're older, older than me? No, but see that. <laughs> Man, all right. After the air, off air, tell me your secrets because I need to know them all. I feel like I'm getting older by the it's minute. got good lighting in here. Yeah. That's, uh... <laughs> me, you and me both. I'm looking around like, how can I not look as old? Um, so obviously 40 years old then, then WrestleMania is in your part of town. One of the biggest WrestleManias maybe ever is in your part of town. Were you a fan then? Were you a fan at the uh, younger age, older age? Where did you jump onto the wrestling train. It was Attitude Era that really got okay. me into it. Obviously okay. aware of wrestling before yeah, yeah, yeah. that. I mean, how could you not with, you know, the peak of wrestling in the late 80s, early 90s? Mm -hmm. I remember it being on at my grandparents' house. Not that my grandpa was a huge wrestling fan, but he just loved having sports on the TV. So that was often hockey, obviously. And it was a lot of basketball or football or baseball. But if that wasn't on, 
we'd have wrestling on just yeah. we'd, we'd watch it and being a six or seven or eight year old kid you'd do the moves on your sister or your cousin or something like that but it was the late 90s it was the height of the attitude era when i really got into it and i remember that was a specific moment too one of my best friends his name was vince reynolds and back in the 90s this is gonna sound crazy now but back in the 90s when you had a best friend when school was over you did this crazy thing called talking on the phone stop it and get out of here wild, right? like, <laughs> and it was every night right yeah so, and the phone had a cord on it <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or, you'd, or the one with the cord that you'd have to charge every hour. Oh, my you know? God, yeah. <laughs> so we would talk on the phone almost every night. And the big passion we had in common was fishing. I'm, I'm huge into bass fishing. Like okay, that's one cool. of my like massive passions. But he loved wrestling. And every night at 9 o'clock in the dot, our calls would abruptly come to an end because Raw was coming on. Mm. And we weren't quite done talking about whatever we were talking about that night. And I said, look, I will turn it on. And at the first commercial break, we'll finish what we were talking about. And I turned it on and I just got sucked into the storylines. And it was Vince and Austin at the time was the main storyline. But I remember him being like, wait till you see this guy, The Rock. He'll, he does this thing called the people's elbow. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what that is, but sign me up. And I just remember just being so drawn into these larger than life personalities. So I'm 15 at the time and it didn't take long until we were doing wrestling moves to each other on the trampoline. And the funny thing about wrestling is when you find somebody else who's into it, you immediately become best friends. Oh, like 100%. it's that scene from Step Brothers, right? Did we just become best friends? hundred uh, percent. Yep. So I, I, my friend group at school changed and grew a lot from just other people who liked wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember seeing people that would be wearing like that, that guy's wearing an Austin 316 shirt. I had no idea Will was a wrestling fan. <laughs> right. And then, you know, you strike up a conversation and now you're best friends. Right. So that's really where it started. And those same friends were doing moves to each other on the trampoline. Turns out a friend of a friend has some gym mats in his backyard. And he goes, yeah, we do some moves there sometimes. I said, well, why don't we like make this like a backyard wrestling federation? Perfect. We all came up with our gimmicks. I was Chris Sharp, who is a very heavily inspired by Triple H heel. And like I taped my right hand and my right wrist and just my left wrist, like Triple H says. <laughs> very heavily inspired by Triple H. But that's really what it was. And I wanted to be a pro wrestler. I went to wrestling school when I was 20 uh, in Toronto. And I trained for a few months. And I was kind of at a crossroads where it's like, do I continue with wrestling school or do I continue with school school? Cause I didn't want to half ass one or the other. So right. I was like, you know what? I'll get my degree. Wrestling will kind of always be there. That's so funny. You say uh, the high school thing, man. I can, I remember my, me and my current best friend, I've known him for since high school. Um, there was the conversation. I was, I was, I was talking to somebody else in class and like, he heard one thing and it like, he turned his head like the rock. It was almost like he heard me say, so who, who do you think hit Stone Cold Steve Austin with the car? And he was like, what do you say? <laughs> you know, almost like this moment, like, there's another guy that watches. Right? This is this is great. <laughs> so, so funny you say that because that's exactly where it still stands to this yes. day. I sent him an article today from WrestleZone and I said, hey, man, remember when this website used to give our computers like the worst viruses of all time? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, and now I'm seeing my name on it. And I'm like, this is so cool. Right. And he was the first person I, I showed. I remember going, the people's wrestling website was the website I went to the most tpww.net. And I remember there were no images at the time. Cause this is, you know, 1999 internet. What's an image. It was just like, <laughs> just links and headlines. Yeah. And I remember that if you clicked on the link, it went from red to yellow and it stayed yellow. And I, I would go on there and I'd be, I would just scroll down. Oh, oh there's no more, uh, <laughs> Uh, yellow links so, so <laughs> reading all these stories as we go all the way up and I, I went to a house show at the sky dome in toronto when it was still called the sky dome mm. and i remember like writing I it's came still with the sky dome by the way it's still the sky dome please don't be one of those people <laughs> it's still the staples center right other discussion. it'll always be staples center to me <laughs> it'll always be sky dome to me well Dude. it has it's actually been the rogers center longer than it's been the sky dome, when i heard that on your show i was like shit am i one of those people <laughs> yeah, that those same people will be like oh man did you see that thing edge did last week i think you mean adam copeland yeah you mean oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Him in, in a year <laughs> like, what? that's amazing anyway how was show anyway, i ahead. remember going with a notepad mm. and taking notes of all the things that had happened in this match and the the girl who i was 
which was my girlfriend at the time, she bought the tickets for me for Christmas or whatever. She's like, what a nerd you are. Like you came to a wrestling show with a notepad and pen? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm starting my journalism life. What? <laughs> Say something else. Right. One day this is going to be my full-time gig. You just wait. Oh, that's so funny, man. Oh, I wonder if God. you could dig. I, I, it's That report, that wrestling report from that show is out there somewhere. I, I wonder if someone <laughs> could dig that out. Oh, we'll have to. We'll have to. That's so crazy. So you obviously... Um, you have the pro wrestling, you, you like the pro wrestling, you had the radio. Where did it all finally kind of meet? Like, where did, did did you just start, you know, applying for press credentials? Like, how did you how did you wind up, you know, getting into where you're the, now the rise of, of what it is now? Oh, well, I mean, look, press credentials for wrestling weren't a thing until the last few years. I think that's like an important thing to point out. So for me, it was I got super fortunate that when I came out of school, I begged, borrowed, and stole my way into an internship because nobody <laughs> was going to give me an internship. Right. But I reached out to the general manager of this small TV station about an hour from where I grew up. And I just said, hey, I'm going to be in town for spring break next week. Could I just come by and talk to you about the possibility of an internship? And he's like, well, we don't usually do this, but sure, if you're going to be in town, come on by. And he's like, look, I, I see something in you. We don't really do an internship like this, but like, We'll, we'll figure something out. So then I started working at my old high school job in the fish department of a pet store to pay for the gas to go to this internship that was 60 miles away, 60 miles each way. Wow. So that was, that was kind of my foot in the door. I was a, a local news intern, which ended up turning into two weeks later being a local news reporter as an intern. Wow. They put me on TV. It was crazy. And then every <laughs> shift after that was me being on TV, which was wild. They ended up hiring me, but I knew news wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Fast forward a little bit, I ended up getting a job at MTV2 Canada. So I moved my entire life from just outside of Toronto to Vancouver. Now I'm interviewing musicians and actors and directors. And then WWE came to town. And I said to my boss, do you think I could interview a wrestler? She's like, yeah, we've done that before. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm going to get paid to talk to a wrestler. And that was where the light bulb went off. That was the moment where I went, oh, I have access now. Like we have this great t television show where we interview people all across entertainment. Wrestling is a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. So every, you know, whenever WWE or TNA comes to town, we can do an interview. And that was kind of where I got my foot in the door where it was twice a year, three times a year, but it was in Vancouver when I had that job. Then I got a job in Toronto and I was interviewing the occasional wrestler there. Then I moved to Cleveland. I was doing the same thing there. And then in Cleveland, I was like, you know what? These interviews are great. And not just the wrestling interviews, the, the actor interviews too. Like, I think these are solid interviews. It's just so unfortunate that with like the traditional style of broadcasting, like the traditional model of broadcasting, the only person that will see this interview with Tom Cruise or Morgan Freeman or Jeff Hardy is someone that happens to be watching Channel 19 on this Thursday, mm. exactly 4, 17 p.m. And I just started taking the raw versions of those interviews and just throwing them on my YouTube channel with the hope that another wrestling fan might find them, another fan of that movie franchise or that actor might find them and go, oh, wow, I really appreciate that he asked about this thing I've always wondered about. Mm. And that was really it. And then there were a lot of independent wrestling shows in Cleveland that would be bringing in big stars. I would just reach out to them and say, hey, could we do an interview with Christopher Daniels as an example that comes to mind, or Rhino was another one that was in town. Can we do an interview with them? We'll put a little bit on TV to promote your show, and then I'll put the rest on my YouTube channel. And the answer every time was yes. Oh, yeah. So it was just me taking the opportunities that I had in front of me and trying to do the most with those opportunities. And it seems to me that you know, and listen, like I've listen, I've seen all the now they're more broadcasted as far as like the WWE finally got into this model where it's like all of a sudden there's like a post game press conference. Right. There's like pressures yeah, yeah, afterwards. Yeah. And that don't get me wrong. I love it. I actually love I love the whole like arrival to the arena thing that they just kind of started. You know what I mean? Like seeing them coming in, taking a page right out of the NFL's book. 110 percent. And they well, should also, because the NFL is the UFC, juggernaut. Like. Like UFC gets it too, obviously. That's mm -hmm. why they've had the massive growth and popularity that they've had. But yeah, no, they're, it, it has such a real sport feel now. Yeah, it does. And so, but it, I say that to say this, I've seen a lot of 
Pro wrestling journalists have you, uh, they get a bad rep because most of the time, you know, it's it's somebody that's like playing a video game, yelling, and and basically, I guess, the, the Cody Crybaby, right? Like the person that's in the mom's basement just dwelling down there saying, I'm going to start my own podcast. Watch this. I feel like with you and some, oh, I haven't had, you know, nearly as many interviews as you have, but what I'm saying is somebody like you is very approachable. Did you feel like that was a, a, a goal from the get-go? Like once you know, um, Rhino comes in or once these guys start coming into you, does it seem to you that you're like, okay, I got to be one of the boys and not Mr. Interviewer. You know what I'm trying to say? Like almost as if like, I got to get on their level. So they don't think I'm one of these, like, I don't want to call them nerds. Cause that's not nice, but like, you know, so some of it's not, we qualified. know what you're talking about. Okay. All right. You're getting, or at least you're vibing and you're understanding what I'm going with here. But like, is that one of the things that you had to start with? Like, I got to get in with these guys to let them know that I'm not the guy that's going to like, you know, make a headline out of this. Like if you had an hour long interview with Rhino and he says one day, you know, I really like the color purple, not color green. And that's the thing you're like, oh, did you hear this? Rhino doesn't even like the color. Yeah, green. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and it came from CVV. Oh my God. So like, it was that like a goal. We're going back to a time like it was, this is 2011, 2012. Mm. The only people really doing these longer form wrestling interviews are me, Sam Roberts and Peter Rosenberg. That's, that's really it. There's the occasional, you know, morning show interview, which, you know, some of them are like, okay, we've got John Kenna here, and uh, <laughs> we here we can't see you. <laughs> what does that even mean? And right? they're like, they're like, ah, oh, look at that. it's like, no, no, sir, it's it's ah, oh, damn it, you messed so, it, you messed it all up. <laughs> I think at that time, if we're going back to 2011, 2012, 2013. A lot of these wrestlers are just happy to talk about wrestling with somebody who understands wrestling. Right. And my biggest thing with interviews has always been trying to build a rapport as quickly as you can, whether that's with a wrestler or it's a musician or it's an athlete, whatever it happens to be, try to build some sort of rapport. So when a wrestler would come to the TV station and they'd be a WWE star, or Ring of Honor star, or a TNA star, they'd come with the handler, I would immediately try to find something. Like I remember when Jeff Hardy came to the, to the station and I was like, dude, I was a backyard wrestler and I did a swanton bomb. And he's like, no way. <laughs> like, show me. And I was like, you want to, you want me to show you? Where's the nearest roof? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's just trying to build that rapport. And like mm. the same thing, like if, if an athlete would come by, I would try to find something where I'd be like, dude, game six, I, I remember distinctly when you did this, this, and this. And they're like, oh, okay. Like, wow. Mm -hmm. Instead of like, this is a very broad example, but if Tom Cruise walked in and you went, dude, I love Mission Impossible, he'd be like, oh, wow, <laughs> hey, thank thanks, you. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> but if you, said, like, if you said something very specific, like my friend Kevin McCarthy is a master interviewer and the way that he like looks at film. So when he talks to someone like Christopher Nolan and he's talking about like the way you use 70 millimeter IMAX in this particular scene and the way that like the bars got removed on the IMAX screen, like that's the type of stuff that these people go, oh, you're speaking my language now. Yeah. So for me at that time, when a wrestler would come in, I would just try to do something that let them know like, I'm a, I'm a real fan here. And, and this, this, and this are things that like you've done in your career that mean a lot to me. And it's kind of your way of saying, I speak your language here. Now, do you at this moment in this time of your career where, again, you've had so many amazing interviews and it, like I said, just recently, I only use it as an example because it's obviously one of the bigger gets. But when you have a John Cena on your show, you know, are you still is there still just a little bit of, of the little Chris, you know, saying like, holy shit, like this is of happening. Course. All right. I'm just not going to make sure because yes. there's been times where. You know, you get brought up in the business and I've had fantastic trainers and fantastic mentors to say like, you know, there was a long, a long time where it's like, don't you dare take a picture with that guy and post it. That's so unprofessional. But then recently I'm just like, F all that, man. I'm only going around this thing once. And if I meet this guy, I'm going to ask him for a picture. You know what I mean? Just like I did with you at the, the, the showcase. I say, yeah, look, I don't yeah. know when the next time I'm going to see this guy is. You know what I mean? So. You're, yeah, you're interviewing these big guys now and these superstars, and I'm talking like you're on red carpets now with Iron Claw and you're doing all this cool stuff. Are you still, is, is the fan still present? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And by the way, I think a photo is a great like promotion for like what is to come. For like, sure. Here's a photo with John Cena or here's a photo with Matt Cardona or whoever it happens to be. That tells people like, oh, this interview is coming up soon. But yes, and I remember the Iron Claw is actually a perfect example. They give you a list when you go to these red carpets, they give you a, a tip sheet, it's called. Mm -hmm. And it's like 
little photos, headshots of, of the people that are expected to walk the red carpet and it will have their name and then sometimes like the, the roles that they're known for. Or if, if they're in this particular movie, the name of their character. Got so it. I'm looking at the tip sheet and this blonde woman walks onto the red carpet. And I do like a triple take. I'm like, is that Trish Stratus? And I like look at the tip <laughs> sheet and I'm like, she's not on here. It, wait. Is that Trish Stratus? And people are like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Is, is that Trish Stratus? And I'm like, is that Trish? That's tr it is. That's Trish Stratus. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Trish Stratus. So I go to like the the, the main publicist for the uh, red carpet, and I'm like, is she going to be doing interviews? Oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. She's just taking the photos here. And I'm like, what do you mean she's not doing interviews? I need, <laughs> I need to do an interview with Trish Stratus, with the Toronto connection, especially. Like I remember being at WrestleMania 18, and she had the second last match. Like. It's shockingly, the match that came after Rock Hogan, which is wild. So <laughs> she takes the photos on the red carpet, and I see her kind of go behind the red carpet, and she's taking some little photos on like the street that's closed behind us. And I just hung out at the barricade on the back and tried to get her attention. And finally, she walked by, and I was like, "Hey, Trish, could could I ask you a question?" She's like, "Hey, I I know who you are," and Boom. I'm like, "What?" <laughs> like, yeah, I'm familiar with your work. I'm like. Oh my gosh. So then we got to talking and then I asked her if we could do an interview on the red carpet. She's like, absolutely. And she came back around. So the short answer to your question is yes, of course. All right, good. Then in the moment. And I think the biggest thing that people who are just starting out with interviewers or just starting out with a podcast or a YouTube channel need to keep in mind is once that interview happens, this is a conversation. And the biggest thing you need to do is be present and listen. Larry King said it best. I never learned anything while I was talking. And you need to be present in that moment and listen to what they're saying because that could turn into another great question. But if you weren't listening and you were just thinking about the next question that you were going to ask, regardless of what they said, you might miss out on that. So yeah, no, I, st I still get, look, I'm, I'm human. But at the same time, I think what excites me the most is knowing that this is a person, no different from me or you, Dave, that had a dream that chased after it, that did everything they could that with all the bumps in the road, they made this dream happen. And that's usually the thing that I'm most starstruck by. Like, how, how did you get to be this good? Like that, that's the thing that I, I think I love the most. Now, is there any part of you now? This is just like, because I, I've been doing, uh, I, after I got out of the ring in 2016, a couple bad injuries later, you know, an ACL here, too many concussions there. I was like, you know what, let me yeah. just, let me just focus on what I'm, when I think I'm really good at and that's speaking and articulating and, and having a, you know, being the play-by-play -play guy for, you know, a place like WrestlePro or any, anything to do with Premiere, right? So is there any part of you and this, I understand the stay humble thing, right? And everybody wants to stay humble, stay grounded. But is there any part of you that's just like sometimes you're watching certain things on television or you're watching other interviews and you're like, man, that that's that's I'm better than that. You know what I mean? Like I can do all that. What I'm saying is, do you have grander expectations than obviously you're you're a very successful podcast, you've hosted events, you're on the red carpet doing things like what are the next steps because of what you just said? Trish knows your work. So all of a sudden you're like, the hell damn right she does I, i've been putting in this time you know what i mean so like I mean, is, is my there, reaction it, was certainly not damn right it was like, <laughs> three days later three days later when it's done happening it's all settled you're like yeah you know trish stratus knows me right but like where are you at where do you see yourself you know going from here what do you want to do i mean just to continue doing what i'm doing would be an amazing thing like my goal now every single day is to wake up excited for what i'm going to do and at the end of the day go to bed and be proud of the work that I've done that day. And not just the work I've done, but just be proud of the day that I had. Mm. John Cena said it really well in our last interview. Like he defines success as being a little bit wiser when you go to bed than when you woke up. That's, that's really it for me. And I, of course I watch lots of things. I'm not watching with a critical eye and going, Oh, I could do that better. I'm watching more of like, Oh, okay. Well they do it this way. I'm going to take a little bit from that. And maybe I'm going to put my own spin on it over here. Cause mm. I think that, Every broadcaster is an amalgamation of all the people that you watched growing up and Very true. maybe some of the people that you're watching now. But my goal now is just to continue to grow this thing. Like a wrestling podcast was never the goal to begin with. Like the goal was always just, I want to be a TV host. Well, I was really fortunate 
to be a TV host and I still am a TV host and a freelance entertainment reporter. I love that. It's amazing. Like the fact that I still get to do this every day is mind blowing to me. Like I, I, I'm, I'm a kid from Pickering, Ontario, Canada, and I get to do this for a living. It's amazing to me. So obviously I want to grow the podcast, grow the YouTube channel, grow all of that. Um, and it's, it's, it's just been such a wild ride and I'm, so grateful that I'm still on it. You're the next one that's going to receive the uh, the Ruby thing that Triple H just unveiled. The whole hundred oh, million subscribers. subscribers. Hey, listen, yeah. man, you're on your way, dude. And, and I've seen it, and, and I've seen like guys like you for for whatever reason. And don't get me wrong, uh, I met Maven a couple years back, and I'm like, this dude has got something. Like I don't know what it is, but he's got something, yeah. and it's going to blow up. And, and sure enough, it did. Uh, but listen, man, it's been unbelievable talking to you i do i would be remiss if i didn't ask you and i know this is kind of somewhat early this will air literally like in, in a day or two right so it's not like it's going to be like timed or too like you know past is cody finishing this story or what do you do you have a prediction an early prediction because i know your prediction could probably change a million times between now and then and wrestlemania is right around the corner philadelphia obviously i'll see you down at wrestlecon and not so much WrestleMania. Somehow Premier's access was denied. But hey, listen, <laughs> I digress. Don't, what? yeah, don't get, I, listen, we even texted Freddie Prince. <laughs> I was like, hey, Freddie, it's the deal, man. Um, but no, it doesn't matter. We're going to make the best of it down there. But do you have a a knee-jerk reaction of all the things that have been happening now? Now you got Rock slapping Cody, Cody slapping Rock. Every, all Now you got a tag team match night one, Bloodline night two, maybe, maybe not. Do you have a little bit of a prediction, Ski? I have been loving watching this it's, and just it's like cinema, man. Cinema just digesting it. Yes. I and I I I'm I'm happy to say that when an episode ends, I don't go, well, yeah, but like what happens? Like, well, what's this gonna lead to? Like, I've been really happy just going, that was a great episode of Raw or Dynamite or mm -hmm. Collision or SmackDown or whatever. If I were to make a prediction for you right now, I have to think that Cody finishes the story. Mm. I will say this, since Triple H has been in charge, we really haven't been let down. No, not at all. There's been a lot of things where it seems like, oh, where are they going with this? We're getting upset. Like when The Rock inserted himself in and whether that was uh, by design or that was a pivot, I, I don't know. And I honestly don't, don't care. It really doesn't matter because what we're getting right now is just, it's so good. And it's not just good in the bloodline and Cody angle, like all the way down. Raw and SmackDown have been fantastic as we lead up to WrestleMania. It, it really does feel like Attitude Era-esque, meaning like there is a star at every turn. Like I'm yes. huge on like, I don't know, Chad Gable. I'm like, bro, push this guy to the moon. Like it, yeah. he's, he's unbelievable to watch. And then you have the mid-card guys and the, the upper class, the women's wrestling. Everything has been elevated uh, within the last, I guess, year or so, two years where, you know, Rock said it best, you know, pro wrestling seems to be cool again and it was always cool to me it never lost its luster but there's a lot of times where you got these internet warriors out there saying like this is the worst it's been in years i can't believe all this how can you not have this happen when rock came out and finally said i'm going after roman and the head of the table i'm like i love you cody but damn i can't wait for this <laughs> you know what and, i mean like, <laughs> and i want to point out that the rock never officially challenged roman reigns and that's a very important distinction to make that a lot of people seem to be mm -hmm. missing out on mm -hmm. there was never a match graphic made there were obviously a lot of it was very heavily hinted right but this was never official he never said roman me and you wrestlemania that never happened there was mm -mm. never an official match graphic made it was it was talked about a lot, and I think maybe that was just like, let's test the water here. Oh, okay, yeah, JK, JK. <laughs> you're, a, you're you're a fisherman, right? You're at the end, and you're like, oh, there we go. We got a little nibble. Oh, oh God, <laughs> and you're like, you're totally pulled in, and you're like, how did the hell did this happen? It's so funny you say no graphic was made because, of course, you know the fans are out there making all their graphics, and I'm like, is that official? I don't, it's like today, like I'm a big NFL guy, and you know it's the worst day to be an NFL fan because now there's like. Right accounts that are just like oh, sources have said that this is confirmed and it's like a graphic and you're like oh it's got to be real right like so you never really knew and that's a very good point there were never actual like terms or anything like that i can't wait to see how it all plays out it's going to be a lot of fun it's it's cool to be a wrestling fan it's fun it's entertaining and that's what it's supposed to be man and i always firmly believe this and you know and i've said this to so many people 
pro wrestling, media, all this stuff. There's so much room for everybody to eat, man. You know, it doesn't have to be so cutthroat. It doesn't have to be so, you know, I'm better than this guy, so I'm going to stomp all over him just so I can get to the top. I'm a big Gary V guy. Uh, he's a big business guy. So he always said, like, it's so much better to build than to tear somebody else down. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have to be the highest sky, you know, skyscraper. Just be there. Just be there. Be one of the skyscrapers. So yes. I feel like it's hey, an awesome time for wrestling. Clapping for others does not take away from your own success. Absolutely. And, I, I, and, I, and I'm clapping for you, Dave, and I'm clapping for Appreciate it, man. Every, everybody else who's doing this. And, my, yeah, my predictions, I think Cody. And look, and I, I will say this, that I thought WrestleMania 39 was fantastic. It's amazing to me how many fans think WrestleMania 39 sucked because of the last three seconds of right. the final match. <laughs> right. Like, no, nah, man, it sucked. Cody should have won. Well, yeah, but even though he didn't, it was a great match. And, I'm, and <laughs> everything else was really, really good. It's so great because like, and now I'm in the minority. I, I do the Fight Factory podcast with Chris Payne and, and Tommy. And I'm like, am I the only one that's like, Man, I would love to see Roman win again and just have the place just like, oh my God, <laughs> when is this going to end? You know, and it just never does, right? But listen, I'm not a writer, uh, a WWE writer there, um, but it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. Can't wait. Can't wait to see you down at WrestleCon. Where could people follow you? Obviously, I feel like if they're watching this, they're already doing it, but you got to plug your stuff. I hope so. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go check out my YouTube channel. It's just my name, Chris Van Vliet. We've also got the CVV Clips channel where you can check out the most interesting and memorable clips from all these interviews. And then just find me. It's just my name on social media. So uh, I look forward to uh, being able to interact with everybody. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. I know you're a busy, busy guy. It feels like you have a new interview every single minute of the day. So bravo to you, your success. It's inspiring. And that's the one big thing with me. When I see guys like you and I see guys like Pat McAfee where I'm just like, okay, he was a punter in the NFL. How did how did he get here now? And now it's like, all right, Van Vliet, he was doing this over here, but now he's got John Cena in his face. Like, how do how do I get there? And no matter what the road traveled, like I aspire to be you. I, I think that you're you're I would one set of a the kind. Bar there. Significantly higher. <laughs> uh, one day, one day, one day at a time for me. But thank you so much for joining me, man. And of course, we'll see you down there at WrestleMania. Oh, man. Thank you so much. We'll see you there. Yes, sir.